Before we start the video, if you're not yet subscribed to Philosophy Insights, consider doing so now. There's an alarming increase in the rate of depressions and suicides in teenagers. The increase is especially dramatic for young girls. And it's more dramatic in those who identify politically left than those who identify right. Why is this the case? Professor Jonathan Haidt argues that social media has a lot to do with it. Journalist Robbie So is skeptical. Here is their interaction. Just one question. <clears throat> so we, we have we have this big change in teen mental health. It begins like in 2012, 2013. Uh, you know, something's a little earlier, a little later, but like it's like right there, <clears throat> just as, as, as American teens move on to these platforms. If it's not that, what is it? The critics, the people I debate with, they never give an alternative. There's no plausible alternative I've heard for why suicide rates doubled a few years over the next few years. I don't know. I think the, uh, the 2010s are probably a, just a more depressing, horrible time than like the 1990s. No, I'm, I'm being totally serious. Um, Kids are stressed out about, some of the things they're stressed out about I don't think are maybe as legitimate or to be worried about, but they're worried about climate change, they're worried about, you know, the, the, the promise of going to college and, you know, you get taking out loans and then you pay them back because you get a good job. That Like, there's some instability in, in the kind of economic uh, situation for them that I, I think things were more chill and relaxed in the 90s. Um, like, I think that's kind of true. There, there's it's hard to put your finger on what exactly it is, but like the last 10 years have been a worse time, I think. The, the crime is up, uh, it, is, it is actually up. People used to be right, misinformed about crime and now like their perception that crime is raising is finally correct. Uh, which is not to discount that social media has had something to do with it. I, I, I can buy that a little bit, but I don't, I, it seems to be happening at the same time rather than the direct cause to me. Well, now, now here we're allowed to like interrupt each other, right? Well, <laughs> like, you know, and have like a normal conversation. Yeah. So, well, um, Okay, so yes, in the last few years, I think you could make the case that things are, are objectively worse on some measures. But put yourself back in 2012, 2013, 2014, we had the global financial crisis in 2008 or so. The bottom dropped out. Young people thought they had no future. Um, and over the following years, after about 2011, the economy gets better and better. Unemployment drops more and more. The stock market goes up and up. Everything's looking but up. So how, and Does it get why better this... for this age group, though? Does it get well, better it gets... for the but people why, staring this down? But why, would, but why would an improving economy affect, why, why would economic changes affect girls more than boys? Right. Why would, I mean, the timing just doesn't work for it to be economic factors. And in terms of it being scary things in the world, when big scary threats happen, you know what happens generally to suicide rate? It drops. Durkheim found that in the 1890s. When you go to war, people don't say, oh my God, we're at war, I'm gonna kill myself. No, anything, any sort of collective crisis brings people together and that protects against suicide. Suicide happens when people feel disconnected, alone, alienated, not when there's a common threat. And if young women in particular, and we should be clear about this, you see the graphs, it's not just young women, it's young women on the left. Um, just in the last six months, two data sets have come out. All, ki all kids are getting more depressed, but the, it starts first for young women who say they're on the left and it's steepest for them. Um, and so uh, I th would suggest to you that it's because they all got on social media and it's the progressive girls who are all freaking each other out about, as you said, victimization, global warming, oppression, rape culture, all these things. Um, so even if it's the external world, mm. it's brought into them by social media every day while they're awake. But I, they could freak themselves out about that without social media? Not as much. It's, I mean, when I was a kid, we would get angry about things the Republicans did, and there was like one or two every week. You know, and now it's like every hour. Well, but it is, this is a much more politically vicious time. Th that is another major way in which this is just a worse time. Like, our politics are so yeah. broken and so horrible. Yeah. Uh, you know, choices that political actors have made, like, that didn't have to be made, um, that I mean, like the inability to talk about anything other than Donald Trump for yeah. five straight years <laughs> really is sucked. bad yeah. for everyone's <laughs> psyche, no matter w yes. if you love him or hate him, it's yeah. bad for your psyche. Uh, but I, but I, I mean, like I'm not dissenting from the Instagram part of it. Okay. Um, so. okay. But he moves to an even deeper problem that overly social media usage has network effects. As such, it affects even those that do not use social media at all. 
Stop looking just at dose response. This is a network transformation. This affects kids who don't use social media at all because before they could find other kids to play with and now they can't. You, that, you don't pick that up in the correlations of the kid who doesn't use social media because it's a network transformation. It's not just dose response. Uh, comment? Uh, actually, I, could you elaborate on that point a little bit? I think it's the part of your analysis I was actually least persuaded about. That, you know, what, you're saying it's right, it's not just affecting the kids who are heavy social media users, but because there's so much heavy social media use that there aren't enough dissenting kids to like find each other and it's so changing the, the environment. Like, is there enough scientific evidence of that mm -hmm. yet though? Is that really just like a yeah. theory for how this is impacting? Yeah. Well, so the other big piece that I haven't brought up here in terms of the, the depression uh, explosion is the vast overprotection that we put on kids in the 1990s. Right. Kids need to play. They need to right. play unsupervised so they learn how to work things out. Um, and we largely stopped them from doing that in the 1990s, or we, we, de we decreased the amount of free play. This, I believe, made kids more vulnerable, weaker, and then those same kids get on social media. And now I feel like I could do that great Woody Allen movement where he pulls out Marshall McLuhan. I happen to have Lenore Skenazy right here. Lenore, could you right. stand up, please? <laughs> so, Hello. Anyway, yeah. Hello, Lenore. Right. Um, so this is what I mean by a network transformation. Right. Um, before 2009, there's data from a British study I saw. In 2009, it was something like 60 or 70 percent of English girls said they sometimes went over to their friends' houses. Right. And in 2014, 2015, it was like 12 percent. Yeah. Well, that, that's, I fully agree that that's bad. I'm Lenore's editor, reason I <laughs> edit all her things. That, but that doesn't get to the, um, I mean, the government has criminalized doing this, right? <laughs> the government should do less oh, on this front. Agreed, agreed. Yes, the government should make okay. it legal to play at the park. Oh, okay. okay I, we've, get the government out of the Lenore. playground and onto social media. The next question. Uh, both focused on uh, the impact for children. I was wondering if you could focus a little bit on the impact for grown-ups. Naturally, we know about our attention span getting mushed up. But I was thinking if the definition of uh, social media was something to do with an app in which we posted content so that we could uh, share and, and connect, would dating apps be connected within this? And if the uh, algorithms are playing with the, date, with the dating apps, because naturally it's not their objective to get us paired up and live happily ever after, but instead to spend enormous amounts of time constantly looking, could the dating apps be considered a social media that could be actually generating a civilizational impact on how we procreate, develop, and have families and children? I guess that's a question for Jonathan as well. Okay. Yeah, I guess we'll do, yeah. I, I'll, uh, so I, I, I agree with your premise. I think you're probably right. I just read an amazing book, a wonderful book by Cal Newport called Deep Work, and it really affected me in, in terms of the way that I try to work, and it really helped me stay off Twitter, things like that. So I suspect that, these, uh, that, that adults are also very affected, and I think the dating apps uh, uh, probably are affecting emerging sexuality uh, uh, among young men and women. Um, I simply haven't studied it yet, so I don't know. What I'm basically Do you think it's doing affecting is, them in a negative way? From, um, from uh, I, I get, yes, overall. Um, but, there, I'm not, but I'm not confident. I have not reviewed okay. the research, and there isn't a lot of research. What I've been doing is looking where the light is best, which is on children. There are a lot of studies. We have a lot of data, large, large studies. I haven't seen any good studies other than like, you know, decreases in how much people are having mm -hmm. sex. There are things like that, and stories. But I just, so I think you're probably right, but I don't know. Comment from you, Robbie, about yeah. that? Again, in so many of these things we're talking about, I, I agree that a subset, a minority of users can have negative experiences with these things. I, I mean, maybe this comes down to like a philosophical thing. I, like, I am not going to have the government restrict access to these platforms on everyone's behalf because a small amount of users are having an issue, just like I wouldn't make gambling illegal because some people go to the casino and they'll bet everything they have. Um, most people can go and have a good experience. It's, it's just, maybe it's just like a libertarian philosophical thing. Dating apps, I would tend to think, have tremendous Ups, I mean, I don't use them, but uh, they have like made it easier for people to find more prospective partners. Um, they've probably been very valuable to like the LGBT community and others who it would be hard to, especially if you live not in a big city, but it's hard to know like what your prospective dating pool is. There are a lot of advantages. So let's not, you know, as we focus on the harms in a couple categories, which I agree there are harms, like again, let's not lose the tremendous upside of at, at the you know, click of a button at your fingertips, having an entire world of people yeah. to engage with, date, have conversations with, and so on and so Ma forth. Ma yeah. Ma
Thank you for watching this video, and if you like the content, subscribe to Philosophy Insights.